Now, next up, Jouni Mannonen and Secrets of Mountain Sheep. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to try and take this through pretty quickly, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask questions. Because I'm actually going to try and ask you guys a lot of questions. So um, please uh, feel free to flex your arm, because you're going to be using it in this session. So. Um, how many here have actually heard me speak before? One or two people. Great, I can recycle all the old war stories. Just kidding, this is a new thing. Um, we are, and I'm representing Mountain Sheep. Uh, Mountain Sheep is an independent developer in its sort of strongest meaning of the word. Uh, we're completely internally funded and we do what we like. And we seem to be pretty good at it and that's why they ask us if we would like to tell other people what we do. And there are a lot of people always asking us, what, what is it we do, what is it that you are, why are we successful where they are not? But they usually ask the wrong questions. They, they talk about marketing, they talk about advertising, they ask how they can drive people to their game, which is kind of like thinking that customers are sort of sheep and you'd be pushing them towards your game and if there's enough pressure then they'd buy it. But it doesn't quite work like that. So. Um, we're trying to do the other thing. We're focusing on the game. And we're a game developer. We have what usually developers have, an office for about 10 people in central Helsinki. Uh, but we have four number one hits on the App Store on iOS, and each one of them is a different game. If we were sensible people who just wanted a lot of money, we would just take the first one that was really successful and make more of that. But instead, we've been doing different things all the time. And uh, while four of the games are on the iOS only at this point, uh, tomorrow Death Rally will be shipping on PC for Steam. So we managed to do a number of small games. We have actually five games in active development at the moment. It's not a fact that we're proud of with such a small team. It's just where we ended up because we have so many exciting ideas. And we value craftsmanship over everything else. We want to make really, really good games. And this session is really about how we see that the good games are made and how we can have fun making them. And so we left out a lot of stuff. It's kind of funny if you look at what, what do you need in a game company. You make a checklist. Uh, we have more things off the checklist than on it. We have no business plans whatsoever. Uh, we have a, an initial business plan before we started the company and that's long outdated. Uh, we don't write pitch documents because we don't have a publisher, so we end up with no game design document for any of the products. Uh, we don't have a publisher, so we don't have a publisher contract to negotiate. We don't actually outsource our work because our one artist is capable enough. Uh, we just load more work onto him and uh, diamonds come out. And uh, we don't really have pro producers or schedules as such. We just basically work in small teams and make as good games as we can. And the QA is outsourced, and sales and marketing happens by itself. So it's like a ideal situation in that the only thing we're focusing on is games. And this is why I feel alienated when people come and ask me, like, how do you market this? How do you push this to Apple? And you know, how, do, how, how much do you get views and banners and whatever? Because we don't do any of that stuff. We just make games. And the last two games that we made, Ice Raids and Bike Baron, they sold 1.5 million copies in the first six months on the market. That's zero marketing and 1.5 million sales. Uh, so we must be doing something right. I don't know if it's luck or not, but uh, hopefully it can be repeated. So it really comes down to this whole situation. Like the, you go to the App Store, and it's like a huge smorgasbord of everything. And you can pick and choose whatever you want, and you find the right thing for you. And uh, you know, you. You pick what whets your appetite. You go for what feels good to you, you, what tastes good, what smells good, and great. So everybody knows steaks. I, you know, I like mine medium rare. Anybody else? Medium rare? Well done? A few people? OK. So how do you like your sea urchin? Anybody who likes sea urchin well done? Medium rare? Raw? Raw, yes. I, I made that answer once. It was the wrong answer. The, um, I was out eating uh, seafood in, in, uh, 
in St. Louis uh, with a programmer from the Halo team, and uh, she she wanted sea urchin, and she told the chef that you know, she wants it raw, and the chef, chef uh, the waitress had to recheck like a couple of times. Like, Are you really really sure you want this raw? And she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. She enjoyed it. I think it was the worst thing I ever tasted. So, anyway, games are conversations. They're a dialogue that starts from the point that you have this idea and you start to tell other people about it. And you start to sort of build up an expectation for it. Uh, when we made our first game, Minigore, uh, we tar started to talk about uh, Minigore on the um, Touch Arcade forums. And we had about 3,000 posts and 15, uh, sorry, 150,000 views on that conversation thread. And in that thread, we, we showed pictures, we told people what we wanted to do. And uh, you know, a lot of people believed in us. And eventually, we had a fan base before we even had a product. I think, I think that was a great thing. And of course, many of them were disappointed because their expectations didn't meet with the sort of our first publishing thing. But uh, because you, on the iOS, you can repeat and you know, basically go back to the drawing board. You can improve your product. And you can reinforce the purchase decisions by making it better. Uh, you can continue the dialogue. You can basically respond and react to their communication. But as any conversation, it works best when it's polite. So this is also why we don't market. It's, it's actually I, I grew up believing that if you have to ask somebody to buy something, then you're sort of leading them on. I mean, it should be obvious that they should pick it up. But in the communication itself, it's like. You know, if games are a language, then you know you, you need to say the right things. Uh, and a lot of these games, when you started, it's like you, you you come up into a very awkward situation because it's like they don't know how you're supposed to play the thing. They ask you what level you would like to choose from a list that has everything locked. Uh, they they ask which character you would like to use, and there's only one that you have, or couple that you don't understand anything about, or they throw around gibberish words and terms so that you're actually, after you start the game, you're actually longer away from the fun than you expect it to be. And then, of course, the usual uh, thing that hopefully doesn't come up, anymore too often, uh, come up too often anymore is that, would you really like to save your progress? Would you like to throw everything away? But the questions also have to come at the right time. They, um, We've been really successful by having the games communicate at the moment when you're choosing how to play. The game asks you, what would you like, how would you like to play? And here's this free option that you've already unlocked. Here's this other option that you can unlock with a few more points. Or here's something you can buy to enhance your experience. Uh, Supercell has done a great thing with their latest games of only asking to give you push notifications when you already know that there's value in it. Uh, you know, logging an email is something that you shouldn't be pushing for at first because, you know, you, you're just establishing the relationship with this thing. The first thing it wants shouldn't be your sort of contact list and phone number because it doesn't have any business in that. And we also build our games with no metrics. This is, uh, this may be the one biggest and most complicated point that I'm making today is that whereas metric is often seen as data as fact and the uh, feelings and intuition is seen as sort of you know imagination and fluff the truth is that metrics themselves are usually being wrongly interpreted and wrongly believed in to uh, solve the problems of making a good game I mean you should listen to people you should listen to information and we try to listen to people, but we don't actually use any metrics. But instead of doing as I say, uh, well, let's, uh, let's actually jump into this. I'm going to use you guys as the audience to design the sequel to our game. So let's, let's just assume that you would have this perfect situation where you can find the perfect metrics from the kind of people that play games, that understand games, who know what they're thinking, saying, and you can get instant data from them. That could solve your problems of game design, right? You could just basically ask them. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you guys a few uh, choices in what we should be doing in our next game. 
you basically tell me which choice is right, and uh, we'll just go with the majority vote. We'll use the metrics as they come, see where we end up. An ice rage is an ice hockey game. I don't know if you guys, you guys have seen it, but uh, it's a very old one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, simple pong type of ice, casual ice hockey game. So yeah, we're making our next game. Should we make it single player or multiplayer? You are my focus group. Uh, anybody for single player focus? Mm, yeah, about five or so. Anybody for multiplayer focus? Multiplayer definitely wins this one. Um, hardcore casual audience. This is a tough one. If you make it casual, you reach a lot more people. But if you make it hardcore, it might be more fun to some of the people. Anybody for making it a hardcore game? About, yeah, about 10 or so. Anybody for making it casual? Slightly more casual, slightly outweighs this one. So it's going to be a casual uh, multiplayer focused game. Uh, should it have virtual sticks or touch controls? We used virtual sticks in Ice Rage. Uh, anybody for virtual sticks? Um, one or two touch controls? Almost everybody else. So it's going to be a uh, casual multiplayer game with touch controls. Uh, should it have customization where you can make your own characters, or should it have a roster of in interesting characters? So anybody for the uh, deep customization where you can make yourself whatever you want? OK, anybody for the interesting character roster? Interesting characters win this one. Many designs. Uh, should we play the matches from left to right, or from right to left? Meaning that it, when it's on your screen, are you attacking from the left or attacking from the right? Anybody who's for attacking from the left? OK, anybody from the right? That's going to go to the left, this one. OK. And should the default team be wearing red or blue shirts? This is, this is an actual design decision. Anybody for red shirts? OK, blue shirts? OK, blue shirts. All right, so we've got our six, six metrics now. So let's see what we can do with that. OK, so it's going to be a multiplayer-focused, casual, uh, touch-control-based, uh, interesting character game with uh, which side was left to right? Yes, and uh, with the uh, blue shirts. Anybody who agreed with every one of them? Anybody who got it exact, all of them right? Okay, two people, three people. Right, but if you only have resources to do one of the two, then that's going to be the point where you make the important choice. So, okay, so one or two people. And what this actually comes down to then is that for everybody else, we just designed the game that wasn't the best possible one. And with a couple of people that raised their hand at the right time at the exact questions that I asked, we could have just asked him, you know. We don't need all of you. We just need one person who has a consistent feel for all of the questions and all the compromises in the game. And we have our data. So. You can't do that with metrics because if I would go on, what would happen if I had 10 metrics? What, if, what would happen if I had 20? What would happen if I had 100 metrics that tell me all sorts of different things in the game? At the end of the day, nobody would agree with all of them. Uh, and we'd end up with a design that doesn't fly. Now, I'm not saying that metrics themselves uh, are bad. I'm saying that they're, if, if they're applied to game design, that would be the wrong thing. Because what metrics do best is A-B testing things, where you have the resources to actually build both of the things. And then you sample experience from people, uh, see which works best. The problem with us is that we have 10 people in the company. We don't have anyone to run metrics or build the many things. We just build the thing that we believe is the right thing to do. So metrics can help you improve your business, improve your financial return on the product, but it can't design the game for you. Because you, to make a good game, we believe that speed is the most essential thing. Uh, I looked at the metrics today, and uh, in our ice hockey game, it takes about two minutes or two and a half minutes on the average player to start the game, play through, and put it down again. And that's a really, really short time. Now, that means that if 30 to 60% of that time uh, is not fun, the person is already going to turn it off. They're going to move on to the other thing they know is fun. They're going to leave it, and they might never come back. 
And by statistics, if it's free or you know, freely given, if they have, nothing in, they have nothing invested in the product, they actually might do that. They, they'll just drop it. The uh, return rates are really low. So it's a bad idea to waste that precious time on doing something that's not fun. And comparison, by comparison, this is like a normal launch cycle. Like th this is, and this is not a bad thing. This is what games usually do. They show the publisher logo, and they show the developer logo, then they show the game logo, then they run through some intro or video. They go to the main menu where clearly you choose play. Uh, you go to the level select, you select the first level, which is the only one that's unlocked. Uh, it puts you in the tutorial, you know how to play, and then you're in the game. Bam. Great. But uh, how do you do that in two minutes? How do you do that in 60 seconds? You don't. What we do, you launch Bike Baron. You get the uh, game logo, and you get the game. There's nothing in there that stops you from having fun with the game within the first 10 seconds from pressing the icon on the screen. So this is, this is really where we differentiate by making a confident choice about you know, how would you like your steak. We believe that most people would like it medium rare. We serve it to the medium rare, we make it obvious to them, and we deliver it quickly. It becomes fun as soon as you press the button. A good example, another Finnish game, is uh, Swartico by Touchfu. Probably no one from the developers over here, but uh, this is a game that our artist uh, wasn't impressed with visually, and he said that the game has about 15 seconds to make a first impression. And it did. It plays beautifully. It's a lot of fun to play, it's really responsive, and it's a great game. But it doesn't have much of a chance if it takes you to a tutorial that is not fun first. And, you know, about game tutorials. I can't make sense of it. This, this is what game tutorials usually look like. It's a wall of text that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and it's awkward when a developer wants to play it safe. They want to make the game approachable. And the first thing they do is they start throwing pages of text at you. Like, you know, you've got to be careful with this. You've got you to look out. Or, or you're going to die or something. Because it must be really important because you put these walls of text in. Or the um, alternative of uh, you know, showing and telling, which is what we try to do. But the worst thing there is that you can actually remove all the risk and all the fun from the tutorial part. Uh, but you know, ultimately, we try to use as few words as we can uh, to communicate how, how we do or how the game is played and then introduce the elements of the game as you go through the levels. It's also great for the language barriers. It doesn't uh, stop the game from being played in China uh, without them understanding what the uh, words mean, because there's no words. I tried to take some pictures of uh, Spy, v Spy vs. Spy today, because uh, I figured that I'll, I'll pick a random game. I had not played this before, and I'll just take pictures of the screens that the game walks me through uh, before I get to the uh, actual gameplay. Uh, Spy vs. Spy was, uh, it was a favorite of mine from childhood, released about 20 years ago. And uh, this is a faithful remake with the uh, sort of retro modes and everything. And the first few, few screens are normal. They're sort of what you expect. It's like the logo, the characters which give you the feel, the cartoon from the Mad Magazine, which is where it's based on. And then things start to go south. It's a tutorial. And I, I really tried to take pictures of the uh, tutorial thing, but it goes on and on. It, it actually goes on to about uh, teach you a dozen or you know, 20 things, making you press things and read it with no, no risk at all, but with this uh, cheery Alfred Neumann character in the corner telling you that, ah, zap, now you died, you shouldn't be doing that, by first telling you that, yeah, you should do this and you know, try open this door and you'll die. And, and then after you're done, it actually gives you an achievement. You know, it's like mocking you, yeah, great, going, you completed the tutorial, where the only thing you can do is complete it. And it gives you an achievement for it. I don't really agree with that kind of design. And to give another parallel about how precious the time and space is, uh, this is a random you know, Finnish magazine webpage where if you blur out everything that isn't content, you end up with a tiny, tiny part of the screen. So 
really, if, if you really want to make a game where the fun is the key, where you're trying to produce a, you know, an enjoyable experience, then uh, you got to get there quicker. You got to focus. You got to take away the tutorials and teach things as you go along. Afton Blood, yeah, probably would be also good. And people have posted abominations from CNN and you know huge sites that really should know better. But you know, the, it, to give you a parallel, it's, yes. I haven't tried it. Uh, actually, no, I I wasn't of that era. I've I've seen and heard people praise that level, yes, so it has a very good tutorial level. I shall to I shall I shall make put that on the top of my to do list to play. But yeah, the uh, this is to give a parallel because sometimes we need to see things from a different perspective to understand how precious things are, the space and the time. And yeah, with that spy versus spy example, uh, safety is not exciting. Uh, I think uh, Sid Meier was the one who said that games are voluntary, uh, sorry, are a series of interesting choices. Uh, problem he creates in his own games, Civilization and such, is that the choices that come up at turn 1000 are actually not very interesting. I love the first few turns of Civilization. Uh, they teach me things, they make me wander into unexplored areas, but by, by the turn 1000, I'm wondering whether I should build a battleship or a tank. And that's neither one of those choices is going to win or lose me the game. So it reduces the meaning of the choices that you make and the risks that you take. But the worst thing you can do is put that stuff up front, meaning that before you get to have any fun, before you get to take risks, we're just going to put training wheels on you and then hold your hand until you're bored to death. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be an actual risk. It just has to feel like one. Like anybody played through the first Halo. Uh, it's great, you know, you're on a crashing, burning ship and everything explodes and, you know, it tells you, you know, run here, do this, do that, and you feel that you're in danger, but you're really not. Also, um, this is something that we've run into a little bit ourselves and a lot of people do as well, and we try to be careful with this. Don't let your design right checks your apps, app can't cache or your graphics or your marketing. Uh, the uh, old saying about basically that you shouldn't make promises that you can't keep or aren't prepared to keep. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example in a moment. But you should also, when you make these promises, whether it's by showing prototypes or screenshots or whatever communication or marketing, uh, you should repeatedly reinforce that whatever you promised was what you delivered and more. So you, that you always exceed the expectations preferably many times in a row. Because any, every time, like for an IS game, if you update the game and you make it better, you've just reinforced the purchase decision of everybody who already picked it up. So we've got one and a half million people who have already bought the uh, Bike Baron and Ice Rage, and if we improve those games, it's not gonna make us any more money from those people, but they'll more likely tell their friends that, hey, look what I bought, and it's really good. This is what happened to us with uh, Ice Rage. Uh, it's an ice hockey game, but because the uh, screen, the launching screen is so much uh, of a combative one, uh, people thought that there's you know, fighting and basically beat them up in it. And uh, we actually had to add a fighting mode into the game. So, so we've now delivered even on that promise. And we had to put in on another screenshot that this is just a, you know, we're, we're just, this is a mood picture. We're just trying to tell people that what it's like. This is not actual gameplay. But this is, this is what we do. We, we saw that they wanted the fighting. They, that many of them signed up for that. So we made a rage mode. You beat up the other player and you win. And this is the least secret one that, about the secrets that you should be making it fun. Because if you take everything away, you need to be able to evaluate if it's still fun. But this is also the thing that has killed a lot of projects. Uh, people start building first, and then they try to see if fun is somewhere inside there to be found. Because really, it's really, really difficult and really, really expensive to change many of those design decisions later on. And so, like for uh, Bike Baron, uh, when Bike Baron started out, it was a wireframe. The uh, wireframe bike 
on a wireframe track was already fun to play. And that basically gives us the security that whatever time we spend on building it then from th that point on is actually time well spent because it's not going to get any worse unless we you know, do something drastically wrong. So it almost serves as an outline for what the game is going to be like when it's ready and helps people with the imagination to sort of collaborate on taking it in the right direction. Whereas if you start with, you know, let's make these beautiful environments and then try and add some physics on top and see if that works, uh, we'd be in a more, more difficult place with every decision that we make. Because every content decision that you make actually goes on and makes your production even more costly. So here's, a, here's an imaginary design task. Let's compare this task to the next one. Like, let's, let's say that you're designing an action game. You're supposed to be walking and shooting. You're targeting 14 to 34 year old men who enjoy that kind of game. And then, then the design question is then this abstract, like should you put the movement controls on the left or the right side? Left, probably. I mean, I, I usually move characters around with the left hand, but I'm not really sure, sure. Whereas if we change the design task to design an action game for the target audience of yourself, you suddenly go up to 100% confidence that whatever design choice you make is the best one for you. So if you are a gamer and you can represent your target audience, all the guesswork goes away. You don't actually have to, you know, you don't have to make that leap of faith into thinking that, yeah, well, this guy, 18-year-old kid in, in America, when he sees this for the first time, which button is he going to press and you know what he wants to see in the screen it doesn't really work like that of course it means that you need to be in touch with the kind of game that you're making you you can't like i can't make a barbie game i know nothing about barbies or how to communicate that or make it fun but you know i can make an ice hockey game i don't play ice hockey but i play a lot of games so i can be 100 percent confident that for me is the best kind of game and it's that uncertainty, that sort of wobbling uh, negotiation with yourself and with your team about which way each one of those design decisions goes that creates inconsistent and incoherent de designs. And it really, I mean, when we listed things that we wanted to add to the game, coming up with ideas was really easy. We could just, you know, fill pages of ideas that we're going to have this mode and that mode and we're going to have character customization and lots of characters and multiplayer and people give us reviews saying that don't you read your feedback like we want multiplayer don't you read that don't you understand that we want multiplayer in this game and all the time as you go along you still have to make compromises even if you're doing it by yourself or for a company you have to compromise on every decision they're all bound by the same set of rules that you do one thing or the other. The word decide comes from cutting. You're cutting something else away. Finish where it bad dies. It's the pathos is the end of something. So really you start to think about the thing from the opposite perspective is that what do I need to leave out to make this a coherent, consistent game? What do I need to cut away? We needed to cut away a lot of things from Ice Rage based on time and schedule, but a lot of things we cut away from for simplicity. For example, the game doesn't let you choose how long your matches are. This is like a trivial thing. We added a fighting mode, but we didn't put in a choice for how long your matches are. Each round is one minute and 45 seconds. And a lot of th people might think that you should put it in or shouldn't put it in. We feel, felt we shouldn't. And this is, this is what I mean about the uh, confidence in the design, is that it is the right game for us and it seemed to be the right game for half a million other people. And so to develop this craftsmanship, you really need to improve your feel for the product. Because if you can't feel where you're going, you're blind, you can't hit a target that you can't see. And it may mean that maybe you're making the wrong product. If you, if you don't get excited about it, if you can't get your friends excited about it, if it doesn't feel like anything, if you don't play it for fun, then who will? You know, if, if it doesn't entertain you, then who will it entertain? So every time you make these decisions, you leave things out, you get feedback, you listen to the feedback. It's not a metric, it doesn't drive your design, 
but it helps you make the right compromises next time around. And the faster and sort of closer to the loop you can do that, the better. Then the um, one thing that we do marketing-wise is that from all the games in the world that we could be doing, we try to make games that sell. And this is, this is something that even on the art side, Timo, our lead artist, has taken as a value is basically not, not just drawing whatever he likes, but drawing things people resonate with, things that make, make it exciting for other people as well. And it's based on the, uh, we, we base a lot of our work on the fantasy of the familiar. Uh, I think I heard first the, uh, a designer from Insomniac Games talk about this. The idea is basically just that you must have something familiar in the concept and design to have a feel for it. It has to look like a steak if you're selling a steak. It can't look like a sea urchin. Y if you don't have an appetite for a sea urchin, then you shouldn't be trying to sell one, and you, know, you shouldn't be cooking one or trying to figure out how it's done. And this is, this is what makes people buy things. They believe that they get something that gives them feelings they already know. Appetite is the projection of the feeling of what happens after I eat this thing. What happens after I bite this thing? It's a feeling that you have inside, which is a salient feeling and makes it worthwhile for you to take that leap. Then you need to deliver on that promise. And in our games, we've, you know, we've gone all over the place. We've made four different games, but every time Although they're different, they're based on other things. They're borrowing, uh, they're sampling, they're basically tributing to other games. And when we made Minigore, we just wanted to make a dual stick shooter that gave the same kind of gameplay as iDracula had on the iOS, but which has, had been preceded by Robotron and uh, Smash TV and others. Death Rally really was a special case for us because it was to be a Death Rally game. But the, our guys also, they love an old uh, shareware game called Rally Sport. Uh, they wanted to feel of the driving to be a little bit like that. Uh, Bike Baron obviously goes into the action super course and trials line of game to the point that some people reviewed it, reviewing it said that, you know, what's the point? The, the buttons are kind of in the same place as in the other motorcycle games and, you know, like, wh why make another motorcycle game? Well, we made it because we saw that there was an opening for a really well executed one on the iOS app store. Uh, Kingslayer and Puzzler, the second one being a working title, they're actually games that we haven't released yet. But the two upcoming games that we are working on, one of them shares strange resemblances between Fruit Ninja and Jetpack Joyride and has little confetti soldiers that you're slicing up. And the uh, Puzzler is more of a dungeon raid, raid type of puzzle game, but with turn based RPG puzzle gameplay. So again, completely different things. When we, when we released, hat, uh, when we released uh, Ice Rage, uh, well, the first version before we released, it looked like this. It's actually the first version before we released, it borrows the sprites from the uh, arcade version of uh, Hat Trick from 1985, I think, by Bali Sente. <coughs> And we just wanted to first replicate that gameplay and see what would happen if we make a prototype based on that and then you know, extend on that and make it fun. And we extended it with things from Speedball, things from Nintendo, Ice Hockey, and uh, ended up with this. So it's not a clone, it's not a uh, copy, but it takes the same kind of gameplay, same kind of enjoyment that we had with Hat Trick when you know, we played that 15 years ago and even during our development of the game and it makes it uh, into a shiny new package on a platform that didn't have anything that would directly compare to it. And this did really well. We, we developed this game in one month and it has sold 500,000 copies with no marketing. So there is a demand for good games that can commu communicate themselves clearly on the App Store. And so we've never had to drive people to them. People do that themselves. And as I was saying, there's an infinite number of games you could be making. And I've asked, asked the other guys in the office of you know, how many game ideas they have that they'd want to be doing. 
And the answer usually is somewhere between 10 and you know, 50. But there's always many games that we would like to be doing. We're not going to run out of that. So sometimes we have to prioritize based on uh, complexity, on resources, and make the kind of games that we see that will be a fit for this particular market. And if you're not sure if what you're doing fits, then you know, talk to people about it. Make a prototype. Greenlight it with people that you know play games, who enjoy games, and uh, see how they respond. And uh, we are slightly over the uh, end time, but uh, seeing how the previous session also went slightly over time, I'm, we can have a few questions, I suppose. Questions, comments, feedback. QA. Uh, we are, how do we handle QA? We use an external company called Sculpin QA. They're a Canadian company and they basically test everything for us and let us know through email if they find problems. But for playtesting and such, we have to trust our own, own instincts. Okay, that's it. And, uh, you know, feel free to email me or uh, grab my arm over here at assembly or in the forest or at the IDGA nights and uh, I'm happy to show some of the prototypes that we haven't shown anywhere and you know discuss things thanks <laughs>